Good morning, New Calvary Baptist Church family. Good morning to all of our Facebook friends and partners. Good morning to all of those viewing through YouTube. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord and let us exalt his name together. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers and sisters to dwell together in unity. Here it is, New Calvary, on this February the 7th, the first Sunday of Black History Month. This is the day that the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. Let us pray our prayer of invocation. All wise and eternal creator, Abba, Father, Daddy, Mother God, we come before you this morning, oh God, just to say thank you. We ask you, oh God, to have your way in this worship experience, that we will have an intimate encounter with you, and we will not leave this place like we came, but we're going to leave excited to run on to see what the end is going to be. It is in the marvelous, the magnificent, the miracle-working, magnanimous name of Jesus Christ, our healer, our redeemer, our helper, and our friend that we pray, all of God's children said amen, amen. Amen and amen. Let us worship God in spirit and in truth on this morning. mindful of me that you hear me when I call is it true that you are thinking of me how you love me it's amazing who am I who am, who am I that you are
good to be in the house of the Lord on today, and we celebrate all that God has done. We rejoice today and are glad in this moment because we recognize the goodness of the Lord and all that has taken place. And so we welcome you uh, to this virtual worship service here at the New Calvary Baptist Church. We are grateful for the goodness of God, for the mercy of God, uh, for the peace of God, for the power of God that continues to touch us and speak to our hearts and our minds. In this African American Sunday, we continue to rejoice and to celebrate and affirm what God has done through our story. Here it is. This is the day that the Lord has made and we have come to rejoice and be glad in it. So we welcome you, friends and family, uh, to the New Calvary Baptist Church, and we look forward to glorifying the Lord and lifting up the name of Jesus in this worship service. It is good to be in the house of the Lord on this morning. It is good to share with each and every one of you. We're going to share, take a few moments, just to give you some uh, of our announcements for this first Sunday of February. 2021 is already moving quickly, and so we want to make sure that we continue to be faithful uh, in our announcements and in our responsibilities and stewardship to our New Calvary Baptist Church family. I want to just let you, every, everyone, know that we uh, are, are grateful for all of those who have shared and participated this past Thursday, uh, as I had a wonderful conversation uh, including uh, with and sharing in dialogue with the Reverend Dr. Johnny Ray Youngblood, one of my great heroes coming up in this thing called ministry as we discussed This Is Us, the history of violence uh, in America and how African Americans can heal. And so we talked a great deal about a great many different things, and I'm just so thankful uh, for all of you who uh, tuned in, all of you who contributed and asked your questions and shared in what was, I believe, a very poignant and uh, meaningful conversation as we talk about what we move, how we move forward uh, as people of faith and how we use the ma'afa to heal our condition as we continue to trust and seek in the Lord. We ask you to remember and be in tune to, uh, this afternoon at 5 p.m. At 5 p.m., please get on uh, and subscribe and get on uh, the password of that Zoom address uh, that you used on Thursday. And it will we'll be posted uh, on this video for you to have. Uh, please make sure that you sign on as we share uh, in the Still Remembering My Offer. As New Calvary Baptist Church, we'll be sharing with Incarn Ministries at Mount Pisgah Baptist Church of Brooklyn uh, as we continue to share uh, some of the video clips of some of our past Ma'afas that are significant and powerful, and we hope it is a blessing. There will be a live presentation by some of the players of uh, uh, New Calvary's Ma'afa, and it proves to be rich and it proves to be empowering, and we, we want all the support we can get from our New Calvary family. So please make sure that you sign in at 5 p.m. this afternoon. Listen, I know it is Super Bowl Sunday. I know that uh, there are those who are preparing for their tailgates, preparing uh, for their uh, social distant gatherings, but if you can for just about an hour at 5 o'clock, sign in uh, and share and support the New Calvary Baptist Church family. We will be grateful to continue to uh, do this ministry of my Afa. And I am grateful for all of those who have worked faithfully to do that, all of those who have been in rehearsal. I'm grateful, as always, uh, for our co-director, uh, Dr. Margaret Bell. And so continue to just support that this afternoon at 5 o'clock uh, as we share uh, in this my Afa experience. want to just remind you that the FAM ministry is continuing to move forward forward, uh, fam, uh, family advocating ministry, uh, formerly known as our prison ministry, as we continue to formulate and develop ways in which we can reach out uh, to families who are in need uh, of direction and support as we reach out to those who are returning citizens into the world uh, from incarceration. And as we continue to provide food information and even job placement uh, for those who come to share the New Calvary family. If you so desire to be a part of the Family Advocating Ministry or FAM, please call the church office uh, and we will get you uh, some information and we will put you in contact with Reverend Mack who will organize and find some places for you to share and be a part of. We will uh, be uh, restoring our food pantry for the New Calvary family. There's been some conversation and some question in regard to that so we will be doing that soon and we look 
forward uh, to continuing and growing uh, the ministry of New Calvary, not just our fam ministry, but all of our ministries uh, that we might continue to grow. Please uh, be mindful that as we continue to move forward in our ministry and in everything that we need to do, we cannot do it without our faithful giving of our tithes and offerings and the blessings from our New Calvary friends uh, and, the, and the tithes from our New Calvary family. So please make sure that you are giving your tithes and offerings so that we might continue to do the work of this ministry, that we might continue uh, to meet the needs of operations for this church. You can give to 800 East Virginia Beach Boulevard here in the city of Norfolk, Virginia, 23504. Uh, or you can drop that off, or you can mail that, or you can go on Giblify, beloved, and you can make New Calvary your favorite place to give. We hope and pray that uh, you are faithful as we have continued to be, and we thank you in advance for all of your faithfulness and all that you continue to do. Please make sure that you tell your friends and your family that if you do believe in this ministry and support this ministry, to like and subscribe all of our social media uh, posts and all of our social media resources that you would share with us on Facebook as we share on Facebook Live, that you would share with us on our YouTube channel, that you would like and subscribe to us even on Instagram at all at New Calvary Norfolk VA. Make sure that you do that and make sure you tell others about that so that we might continue to grow in leaps and bounds in the ministry in which we are attempting to grow and develop here uh, in New Calvary. Uh, please be mindful that all of the office hours that are taking place on Tuesday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. And so we are excited and looking forward for your support and your help as our administration continues to meet the needs of the New Calvary Baptist Church community. We want uh, to re uh, remind all of you and share with all of you who may have seen it on social media. Please understand uh, that I am excited about the new preaching series that is going to take place as we talk about the miseducation of the black church. I think it's going to be empowering. I think it's going to be significant. I believe with everything in me, it's going to be a blessing. And so we are going to examine uh, how we continue to grow, how we continue to understand some of the things that we have been taught uh, and internalized as, a, uh, as the black church and how we can look to grow and transform and to stretch uh, and see ourselves growing uh, in faith even deeper. So we will be doing that through the month of February and maybe a little bit further, uh, but we look to see how God is going to reveal and show up in this sermon series. So make sure that you let people know and tell people uh, to subscribe and get involved uh, and share in this preaching experience. We want to take this time to just acknowledge and recognize all of the birthdays uh, of the month of February, all of those February babies, those who have been born in the month of February, we want to acknowledge and celebrate and recognize you in this moment. So if your birthday is in February, please put it in our comment section and share with us in the comment section so that we can celebrate uh, your birth and, and your blessing to the world. But right now we sing happy birthday to you as God continues to shine upon you. Happy birthday to you. and many, many, many more. God bless you. We also want to recognize all of those who have wedding anniversaries and who celebrate wedding anniversaries in the month of February. All of you who have birthday uh, anniversaries in the month of February, God bless you. Please put those anniversary dates uh, in uh, the comment section. Please make sure they're correct. Amen. Make sure that you agree on the date. Make sure they're correct and we celebrate you uh, and cherish uh, the matrimonial bond that you share. And may God continue to bless all of you. We're going to continue to move forward in this worship experience as we prepare our hearts and minds for prayer in this moment. We understand the significance of prayer. We understand that there are many in the New Calvary family who are requiring and who are asking for prayer even in this moment. But we know that there are so many that are going through in terms of the COVID-19 virus, so many who are looking to uh, for family members to pull through. We continue uh, to pray uh, for uh, 
the Armstrong Turner family. We continue to pray uh, for George uh, and Willie Bay Little. We continue to pray for Sister Mahogany Vaughn. We continue to pray for so many uh, who are going through so many different things in this time. Uh, but there are those who have specifically called and reached out and asked uh, that they be prayed for and thought about uh, in the hearts and minds of our new Calvary family. And so we pray for Sister Emma Tyree. We pray for Sister Barbara Willis. We pray for uh, Darlene and Wayne Baxter. We pray for Dolores and Joe Turner. We do pray for Willie May and George Little, as we mentioned. We pray for Brother Willie Turner. Um, we pray for Brother Harold Brown. And so we continue to lift up all of those. Uh, and even that, we pray for Sister Alva Barrett, who lost her mother, Elizabeth Trimble, in Tennessee. And we pray uh, not only for uh, the family, we also pray for traveling mercies uh, in all things. And so as we continue uh, to go forward, uh, let us be mindful as we go to the throne of grace that prayer does indeed change things. And we continue to trust in the Lord in a word of prayer. God, we thank you and we love you. We lift your name, Lord, and we are grateful for all that you continue to do. God, we thank you for this day that you have allowed us to see. Grateful, God, for the time that we have come together to worship you in spirit and in truth. So we ask, God, that you would just have your way. Continue to speak to us right now in this moment. Lead us, God, as only you can. Direct us and uh, control our hearts, our thoughts, our minds, that we might walk in the will and in the way of our Lord and Savior. God, we pray that you would touch all of those under the sound of my voice. We pray for all of those who are watching and sharing virtually with us right now. We pray, God, for the New Calvary Baptist Church family. Pray for the extension of our friends. We know, God, that we have been blessed by this moment. Know, God, that we have been blessed uh, by the opportunity just to worship you one more time. So, God, if you will, just have your way. Speak to the hearts and minds of your people. Lead us, God, and we will indeed trust you with all things. God, we pray right now for a nation that needs your healing. We pray for a nation that needs to refocus and be restored. We pray, God, for your church that continues to wrestle, not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities of this world. God, we pray that for every household uh, that is uh, moving forward in your name. We pray uh, for every house that is dealing with finances right now. We pray for every body that is wrestling and struggling with health issues right now. We pray, God, that you might restore, that you might continue to move and speak uh, to each and every one of us, to each condition, to each situation, whatever it is, you might find a way to continue to let us know and just to touch us that we might be reminded that you're still God all by yourself, that we might be reminded that you're still working things out, that we might be reminded, God, that you're still in the blessing business. So have your way, Lord, as you continue to touch us. Have your way as we continue to move forward. Have your way as we continue to remember and celebrate those ancestors in this month who have been a blessing to us and showed us along the way what it means to put our hand in your hand, what it means to truly walk with the Lord, what it means to truly understand what it is to be kept by Jesus. So have us, God, continue to grow. Have us to continue to be strengthened by your spirit. And in all things, God, we will give your name the praise. We'll give your name the honor and we'll give your name the glory. It is in the wonderful, marvelous, and majestic name of Jesus that the people of God who love God together say amen. Say amen and say amen. Come on, put your likes up, put your hearts up as we prepare for our outstanding musical aggregation to bless us uh, and prepare our hearts and minds for the sermonic moment. So come on and let us receive this choir as they lead us in celebration and in song.
mother for the motherless. Mother for the motherless. Put all your trials. Put all your trials. In his name is Jesus. Motherless. His name is Jesus. He'll never leave. Put out, put Declare one more time. He's a miracle worker. He's a miracle. He's a miracle worker. 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 He's a way out of no way. 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 He's a way. For the motherless, he's a mother for the motherless. His name is Jesus. He'll never leave. Put all your trust. Put all your trust. Put all your trust. Truly, we are grateful for uh, the New Calvary Choir and the New Calvary musicians for blessing us in such a way. Grateful for sharing in this moment, grateful for the gifts of worship that have continued to feed and nourish uh, our worship experience. We look to the Lord in a word of prayer and declare, God, how thankful we are, how grateful we are for the time uh, together, how thankful we are for the many blessings that you have placed in our lives. We pray, God, in this moment, uh, that there might be preaching power. We pray, God, that we might be restored. We pray, God, that we might find hope, uh, that we might find possibility, that we might find power in your name. 
So speak to our hearts, God, for someone is listening that needs to be reminded that you're still working things out. Somebody needs to be reminded, God, that you are still in the blessing business. Keep us right now, God, in all things and bless this your instrument. Allow it to play your music of grace and mercy. And God, as we continue to go forward, we in all things might just know how to say thank you. And we just might trust you with each and every step. Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, for the power of thy grace divine. Let my soul look up with a steadfast hope and let my will be lost in thine. It is in the wonderful, marvelous, and matchless name of Jesus. The people of God who love God together say, Amen and Amen. I call your attention to the book of Genesis, second chapter of the book of Genesis, in the beginning of the seventh verse. The book of Genesis. Uh, just open your Bible, and it should be right there. The book of Genesis in the second chapter, beginning at verse 7. We're going to look at uh, verses 7 through 22. And it is translated in the New International Version in this way. The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. And the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. A river watering the garden flowed from even Eden, and from there it was separated into four headwaters. The name of the first is the Pishon, winds through the entire land of Avalia, where there is gold. The gold of that land is good, and aromatic resin and onyx are also there. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It winds through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is the Tigris. It is, runs along the east side of Asher. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden and worked it and to take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, for if when you eat of it, you will surely die. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all of the beasts of the field and all of the birds of the air, and he brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the air, and all the beasts of the field. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib that he had taken out of the man and he brought her to the man. Starting at verse 7, these words, the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. And also, when we look at verse 13, the name of the second river is the Gihon, it winds through the entire land of Cush. I want to talk for a while from this thought, from this idea, beloved. Uh, your strength is in the story. Your strength is in the story. See, over the course of the next 24 days, 25, 23 days, 
or so, many people will engage in the celebration and have already begun to celebrate what has come to be known as African American History Month. Initially inspired by Dr. Carter G. Woodson, who was a prominent African American historian, which he began to celebrate Negro History Week. Woodson, a prolific thinker, challenged the understanding of history as a tool of empowerment and transformation. Woodson believed that telling the right story, the true story, of a people would transform the thinking and the belief of a people to do transformative things. See, Carter suggested that African Americans have been miseducated. He is the author of the book, The Miseducation of the Negro. And we have been, in his premise, been miseducated in the sense that we have been given a story that is not only incorrect, but it is racist at its intent. It is incorrect because the whole story is not told. And it is racist because in many instances, people of African descent have been intentionally and permanently left out. He suggests that because we have been taught the wrong information, we have internalized the wrong idea about ourselves. Here it is. Woodson suggests because we have not been properly included in the story, that we don't know who we really are and what we can really do. So what Carter G. Woodson recommends is a re-education, a new look at history. Woodson said that every person has two educators, that which is given to them and the other which they give themselves. Uh, one of the two kind of the latter is far more desirable. Indeed, all that is most worthy in people, they must work out and conquer for themselves. It is that which con uh, uh, constitutes our real and best nourishment. What we are merely taught seldom nourishes the mind like which we teach ourselves. And it got me to thinking, my sisters and brothers, if we have been miseducated in history as African Americans, then surely we have been, or there has been, miseducated as believers in the faith. Now, let me just say before we go on anymore, I understand that the Christian faith is essential to the lives of many African Americans in this country. I understand it has been without question our help in ages past. It has been the rock and the source of a firm foundation. It has been a bridge over troubled water. It has been a vehicle of empowerment and transformation. And I in no way mean to make light or disrespect the faith that has brought and help so many of our ancestors through and us even right now. It is why I stand here. It is why I have been called to this work. It is what I believe. However, it does not mean that everything we do is healthy and it does not mean that all that we do as a church is theologically beneficial to who we are. We know that Christianity did not start here in America. That is a given. And we know that Afri African Americans did not first receive Christianity here in America. But the Christianity that Africans were given here in America has crippling overtones of oppression, false doctrine dealing with race superiority, sexism and misogyny, racial division, uh, the long-time relationship and partnership with white nationalism, hierarchical ideology, self-mutilation and denial in the name of a false righteousness and a host of other toxic views that African Americans have digested, we've believed, we've contributed to, and we've reinforced in our own faith walk. Just because the gospel of Jesus has been helpful doesn't mean that it cannot be better understood. And like Carter G. Woodson said, we just don't take what we've been taught. We become stronger by what we teach and learn ourselves. So this is what led me to this preaching series, The Miseducation of the Black Church. And I believe we start to look at the story of faith through a different lens. A lens that tells the whole story. And when we tell the whole story, we will realize that we have been in the story from the very beginning. 
Now, we're not just going to get a few sermons. Uh, and we're not going to get it all in, in a few opportunities. We're not going to clear up the issues of Christianity and all of its layers in one shot. But hopefully what we will do in this moment is generate some thinking and thought about who we are and that we might wrestle with some things that we've been taught throughout the years. But I think what's important is to know um, that it all brings and begins with telling the right story. It all begins, my sisters and brothers, with making sure that we tell the right story. That when we understand that we have a responsibility to tell the right story, we will understand that God has always intended for us as a people to be in the story. I have said this before. The Bible, much as it brings dismay and shock to many, is not a history book. That's not its intention. I don't mean to scare you. I don't mean to sound heretical. But the Bible is not a history book. Uh, it's, the Bible is a book of faith. We don't go to the Bible to understand history. We go to the Bible to better understand our relationship to God. The Bible is a book of faith with historical cues, with historical places, and with historical people. There is history in the Bible, but it is not the Bible's main responsibility to teach history. Its main responsibility for us is to understand who God is and how we can grow in this relationship to the best of our ability. I say that because we have focused sometimes too much on the wrong arguments. We spend too much time arguing about the wrong stuff, particularly as people of color. We have resorted to saying that Christianity is the white man's religion that it's a tool of control for the empire. And there may be some truths in that, but I would argue that it's not the faith that's oppressive, but the way that it has been presented that has brought about a certain perspective. That if we understand that from the very beginning, God has included us in the story, we might understand our relationship with God a little bit better. If we take a moment to consider what the story is saying, we may come to see this relationship with the Creator a little bit clearer. What does it really mean to say that I am created in the image of God? The truth is, my sisters and brothers, it's all in there, in between the lines of our story. God's story is our story, and our story is God's story. We just need to have the courage to unpack and retell the story so that we can understand who we are and what we have been given a little bit differently. God has had our involvement in it all from the very beginning. And our strength comes from knowing that our history, our power, and our purpose is all written in the story. So journey with me in the text and see Understand, I got to move fast. I know it's Super Bowl Sunday. I know you got to still get to the grocery store. Here it is. Understand that uh, because you're still in the story, because you're always, you've always been a part of God's plan. There it is. You're, you're in, your strength is in the story because you were always a part of God's plan. Look, the creation story has been seen many different ways and turned over and evaluated in many different perspectives for generations upon generations and many different reasons, and we examine the story as a foundation of what it is we believe. God and God's time begins to create. God creates light, and he creates it in relation to darkness. God creates water and living streams, and they are in concert and in relation with the land and the earth. God creates the, and the exist uh, in um, the, the universe uh, and creatures of the earth that exist in concert with one another in places of land, air, and sea. God creates vegetation to produce organic life, to grow and produce from their trees and the vines and the branches, and they work in concert with the animals and the creatures of the land as sustenance. And in all of this is in the first account in chapter 1. Just read chapter 1 in the first account of creation, and it says that God created humanity. God created humanity humanity, man and woman, God created them, and in all of it, God says that it's good. You missed it. Everything God created 
is good. Everything God creates is good. God doesn't create anything by accident. God doesn't create anything for it to be abused. God doesn't create anything for it to be less than. God creates everything good. The creation has taken place, and it is good because it operates in concert in re and in relationship with everything else. That what God has created operates in function with everything else around it, and here it is, God did it. The point is, God has done it. Whatever has taken place, God has made it happen. That's deep. It's not that deep. It's not that multi-layered. It's not that mystical. The point of it all is to understand however the creation has been done, God has been responsible. Now, it's not about arguments with evolution or Big Bang theories. It's not about Darwin and competition. It does not have to be an either or or situation. The story from the text is that we serve a God who creates, a God that builds, and not how God creates, but the fact that God is involved in the process when creation starts. And in this process, God created with deliberate intention. God created with intentionality. God created with purpose, humanity. We're in the text. That's what it says. When you look at the second story, our text for the day, you look at the second story in chapter 2, there in the seventh verse, we read it. It says, the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. Humanity is created by God. Watch this. The text says the man, but the Hebrew word that is used in the text is Adam or Adama. Adam means human. The human is created. We get the name Adam from Adam. And so the text is telling us that God creates the human race and place them in a garden called Eden. Why is this important to the story? Because when we look at Eden in the text, there is the, in verse 10, it says there's a river that flowed from Eden. Uh, and from it formed four different headwaters. And one of the rivers, as one river flowed into four rivers, the Pishon, the Gihon, the Tigris, and the Euphrates. Now, follow me in here because it gets tricky. The original river, that's what it says. There is a river that flowed into four rivers. We just read that. But it says the original river, nobody claims to know where it is or what it was. Um, that's it. The biblical scholars, have hummed and hawed and tried to wrestle and act like they could not know what body of water they've been talking about. But it's interesting that the Nile, the biggest body and the biggest river is right there. The Nile is right there, but they're acting in denial to act like they don't know what the main water source has been. It's been the largest body of water source in the region, but we'll leave that alone for argument's sake. The first two rivers, the Pishon and the Gihon, are unknown, but the location of the Gihon, the Bible says that it wound through the entire land of Cush. Hold up, stop, rewind, press play. The river Gihon went through Cush. Now, the reason why that doesn't fascinate you is because Cush is now known as Ethiopia. And so we know where the region is. And Ethiopia is just south of Egypt. All of that is in northern Africa. Some of y'all still missing it. They call it the Middle East now, um, but then the rivers, the flow is in Africa. Okay. I'm making some of y'all nervous. I'll put it to you like this. But what I'm saying now and what I'm trying to let you know is, is how you tell the story matters how you interpret the story. So can I help some of y'all? The name Ethiopia literally means the country of the blacks. Look it up if you think I'm lying. Cush, now called Ethiopia, is the country of the burnt face people. 
uh, or the country of the dark people. Some of y'all still ain't getting it. God creates the human race and place them in Eden, a place that is now known the, as the country of the blacks. Uh, so can I help some of y'all who are still struggling, who are still uh, having trouble embracing this thing? When God created humanity, God had you in mind. That when God created the first people of the earth, they looked something just like you. When the story was started, it was started with you. Chapter 1 says that they were created at the Beth Selem Elohim, in the image of God, that they are created in God's image. That means God's idea of what humanity would look like looks just like you. This ain't somebody else's story of faith. This is your story of faith. This isn't somebody else's history in creation. This is your history of creation. You weren't cut out of the story. Baby, you were written in the story from the very beginning. You are an addition. You are an addendum to the faith process. Your story didn't start here on this continent. Your story doesn't begin with slavery and American imperialism. Your history doesn't begin on the shores of America. Your story begins with the creation of human beings. God started it all with you in the plan. It's not what you've been taught. It's what you come to teach yourself. And you need to teach yourself what the truth really is. So what does this mean, beloved? If God has created you, God started all of this on the continent of Africa with you as the main character. You have been created by God, for God, and with God in mind. So what does all of this mean? It means that if God has created you, then God got a plan for you. If God created you, then God started humanity with you, then God will be with you to see it through. It means that if I'm created in the image of God, then God is not intent or interested in seeing me fail. God is looking for me to overcome. God's desire is that I would be the best me that I can be. The God in me wouldn't have it any other way. So when I start to see who I am and who I was created to be, that I might operate a little differently. I I might think a little differently. I might behave a little differently. That I would not run from the obstacles, but the God in me would remind me from the very beginning that I've been on God's mind. I started on God's mind. I'm still on God's mind, and I still will be on God's mind. In fact, I've been designed to endure. I've been designed to make it. I've been designed to get through it. In fact, that's the reason that I'm still here, because I I come with some of the original parts and because I come with some of the original parts I'm still strong I'm still pushing and I'm still making it God is not finished with my story God is still using my story I'm still a part of God's plan I just need you to know that I understand my story and I'm gonna live it like I'm a part of the plan that God has for me you're your, your, your strength is in the story because you've always been a part of God's plan. I don't care what your high school history book told you, you've always been a part of God's plan. Don't care what your social studies teacher told you, you've always been a part of God's plan. I don't care what some Sunday school teacher told you, you've always been a part of God's plan. But the second thing is, your strength is in the story because you've been given the responsibility of providing protection with the creation. Okay, here it is. Your strength is in your story because you've been given the assignment of protection. The writer says, it's all been worked out. You're in the story. You won't have to get caught up in feeble attempts to take Christianity out of Africa or take black faces out of the Bible. You don't have to look at this as something that was given to you out of the benevolence of white evangelical imperialism, uh, which is turned into some type of manipulation of your conscious center. No, this was created with you in mind. This was created with you in the script. Humanity started with you. God had you in mind when God started it all. Your creation was a part of the plan, but you have a role to protect the creation. Follow me. Here it is. Verse 15 says, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it out 
and to take care of it. <laughs> he put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. God's plan is that people would protect creation, not destroy it. You see, like we said before, everything that was created was created in concert with something. Light in concert with darkness, water in concert with land, creatures and land of the air and sea in concert with each other and with concert in harmony with the vegetation of the world. It was all created so that it would function and operate and work together. It was designed that it might work together, that it would work in harmony and help each other. Humanity is designed to work in harmony with it all. Humanity is, in desi is it designed to work with all of creation because humanity is God's creation. God is looking for humanity to protect creation, to work with creation, not destroy it. God is looking for humanity to work with the creation and not to destroy it. God has been looking for the human race to be the stewards of the earth, not to be the abusers of the earth. Some of y'all are missing it. Look at verse 19. The Lord God had formed out of the ground all of the beasts of the field and all of the birds of the air, and he brought them to the man to see uh, what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. Naming is a process of investment. When you invest in the name of something, you invest in its care and in its development. There is a stewardship involved in the process. You don't name something and then walk away from it. You name it so that you can make sure that it's all right and it's taken care of. What has happened in this turned around idea of how this world is supposed to operate, we have moved to a place of from, a, from a place of concern to a place of consuming. We've moved from a place of concern to a place of consumption. So our desire is that we would consume things and not take care of them. The less we care, the more we consume. The less we care, the more we destroy. The more we consume, the more chaos is created. God's attempt to get us to care for the world has been corrupted by the need to possess and control the things around us. As a result, we have lost sight of what it means to be in harmony with the world and nature and everything that's around us. We care less about the environment and care more about our space. And so we keep clearing out forestry and trees so we can build more buildings and consume more property. We care less about the environment and we care more about profits and the economy. So we don't talk about changing energy sources and moving away from fossil fuel because big oil companies are going to lose money. And so we continue to deplete and destroy the ozone layer. We care less about human welfare and more about budgets and government. So Republicans don't want to talk about a real stimulus money or package and help struggling Americans in this time. And we don't correct the water issue in Flint, Michigan because it takes too much money to do and people still have to live with toxic water. We care less about the kind of future that we are leaving our children for future generations and we care more about the bottom line and we, and we have people who try to deny climate change and focus on pocket change even as polar ice caps keep melting and beaches and land are eroding away. We don't care about health and welfare of human beings. We care more about our own personal issues and so nobody gets upset when they put a landfill after landfill after landfill in inner cities of this country and when people of color and low income living in food deserts have, and the closest store to buy decent vegetables and food is five miles away and poor people don't have cars and we are not cared about the environment we have wanted to consume the environment we have not cared about what's happening to somebody else we have been consumed by our own desire and the controlling everything that we can have for ourselves. We have created chaos along the way. And if we truly want to be faithful to the story, if we truly want to tell the story right, we have to know that our stewardship to creation is a part of the story. If we truly want to be believers, then we have to understand that the text says we have to be stewards of all of creation. We have to understand that's our part in the story. 
we have to understand that if we want to get the story right, we got to make sure that we understand that it's not just good to be stewards of our own finances and our own families, but we need to be good stewards of the planet that we live on. We need to be protective of the places that we live. We need to be protective of the people who don't have a say-so or who get pushed around by big business and by big government. We need to know that we still have a voice in speaking up about the injustice of housing, the quality of life, the access to healthy quality food. We have to have respect for what God has created, not move away just more and more for ourselves, but have respect for creation, and that means all of God's creation. Our story wasn't about having it all for ourselves. That ain't never been our story. That westernized idea of commercialism that you can get more and if you see it, you should get it. That's never been our story. Our story wasn't about having it all for ourselves. Our story was about helping out where we could and sharing what we had. Some of y'all are in places of success and God be praised, but some of you know what it's like to have borrowed a bag of sugar. Some of you know what it is to have your next door neighbors over, not just to see them, but so that everybody in the neighborhood or in your community could have a good meal and have something to eat. Some of you can remember neighbors bringing you vegetables and fruit from their garden. They didn't do that just because they had too much. They did it because they know somebody else needed something too. Our story comes from knowing that having it all doesn't mean everything, that having it all is not the end of it all, that our story comes from knowing that a little bit goes a long way when community gets involved in the process. Some of you laugh about it now. Let me make this live. Some of y'all laugh about this thing now, but you, some of y'all remember what it was when you were young, uh, particularly if you spent a little time in the country. You remember what it was um, that when you were hanging out and the rain would come and then the thunder would show up and then the lightning would happen. And when the lightning would happen, your big mama, your grandmama, your auntie, your, even your mama, uh, when the lightning storm would come, big mama told you, go and sit down somewhere, turn the lights off, be still, because God is doing God's work. Um, that might have seemed superstitious to some of y'all. That might have seemed a little bit ridiculous, but it was really an effort to be in harmony with nature because you understood that some things were out of your hands. You understood that some things were bigger than you and some things had to work out around around you and you weren't a part of the process. You had to understand um, that what was going on uh, was about what God was doing and you had to let God work it out. We still have a responsibility to protect one another. We still have a responsibility to look out around us and look out for those around us, even the environment that surrounds us because God got some plans that we don't know about. God still got some things to work out without our permission or our instruction. God God still got some stuff that God is up to, but we just got to be faithful to do our part and be partners with creation and the environment around us and know that God is still in control and God is still doing the leading. Sometimes you need to know how to sit still because God is doing his work. Sometimes you know how to sit still because God is still working some stuff out. And your part is, uh, your part, your, your responsibility is to do your part, which your part requires. We're called to be stewards of God's creation. We're called to be responsible with this creation. So your strength is in the story because you've always been a part of God's plan. Your strength is in the story because you have an assignment and a responsibility to protect you. But the last thing is your strength is in the story because God has built all of us for partnership. God has built all of us for partnership. Look at the text. God says, I need you to understand your connection with creation. When you understand your connection with creation, then you will understand your responsibility to care for what you're connected to. Which puts us to the next point or the next move of the text. Because God discovers something. God discovers something that Adam, about Adam, God discovers that Adam doesn't work well alone. He understands that Adam don't do well by himself. <laughs> Adam, the earthling, the human, <laughs> the creation, cannot sustain itself well. It cannot be alone. Uh, that's what the text says. Look at it in verse 18. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. 
What happens then is we go to the naming of the other creations in Eden. Uh, and humanity is faithful in naming all of those creations. Whatever he named it, that's what it became. But the end of verse 20, it says, But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. And that thing stuck with me, suitable helper. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into his deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs. Close up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man and brought her to the man. Now follow me. Could it be, a suitable helper, could it be that this is a story about partnership as much as it is about relationship? Mm, here it is. Could this be that God wants us to understand how we connect with each other as much as what our relationship looks like. Here's why I say this. The woman is named or called Eve. Eve in the Semitic Sumerian language is T, T-I, T, which means rib, but it also means life source. So if Adam means human, and Eve means life, then the connection of Adam and Eve might be about how we find success in human life is to make sure that we have good partnerships. <laughs> Some of y'all missing it. I can live fully if I'm connected to others around me. My life is fuller when I'm connected to the individuals and people around me and I have good partnerships. And listen, I'm not talking about marriage. I'm not talking about marriage. I'm not saying everybody should be married. That's not what I'm saying. That's one of those places of miseducation. I'm not saying everybody should be married. That's not the suggestion. Quite honestly, I think there's some people who should be married and there's some people who should not be married for a whole host of different reasons. But what I'm talking about is partnership. I'm talking about how we connect with one another. The reality is we are built for connection, but to be built in partnership, we are built for partnership with each other. God says that there is no suitable helper, meaning that the goat wasn't suitable. It means that the eagle wasn't suitable. It means that the giraffe wasn't suitable. It means that the muskrat wasn't suitable. The Doberman Pinscher wasn't suitable. What gave Adam life was somebody to partner with and have connection to. What has happened is we have gotten so caught up in placement and position rather than partnership. We focus more on what our place is or what our position is rather than how we partner with one another. We have to be higher. Or we have to be better. We got to be stronger. We got to be the one in charge. We got to be the one that's first. We got to be the one that's in front of everybody else. When all that we have learned from that kind of thinking is that what it does is really destroy humanity and not connect humanity. Our obsession with hierarchy and who's in control and who's dominant has blinded us to the most important thing, and that's connection. Our thirst for dominance has created division. If we don't see that anywhere else, this is parenthetically, if we don't see this anywhere else, we see it in our government right now. We see it in our Republican and our Democratic behavior that we've understood that the desire to be dominant has done nothing but create division. In fact, if I can, if I can mess some of y'all up right now, the idea, the very idea and the very concept of dominance is a made-up notion. <laughs> the very idea and concept of dominance is a false notion. Can I help you? You can't be dominant if you need a helper. How can you be dominant if you need some help being dominant? You can't be dominant if you need somebody to help you to be dominant. That's poor partnership. The idea of superiority and dominance is a concept created by the need to be in control. And for centuries, we have perpetuated a concept, an idea about dominance that has caused white people to believe that they are superior to people of color, has caused men to believe that they are superior to women, has caused the rich to believe that they are superior to the less fortunate, has called the elder to believe that they are superior to the young, has called the binary people to believe that they are superior to the non 
non-binary or the gender different and all of that has done is really created uh, division and not dominance. The desire to be dominant creates division. And we don't have to all be the same. We don't all have to agree on the same thing. That's not what partnership is. Partnership is working together, not agreeing upon everything. We just need to leave room for people to be suitable helpers to one another. That's the question. Are you a suitable helper for the people you partner with? This country has perpetuated the lie of white racial superiority for centuries. It has told the lie of inferiority, subjugation, God's will for slavery, blacks' inherent destiny to suffer and live in servitude, the blaming of people for being poor, and it does it at all at the same time absolving themselves of any wrongdoing. And here it is, the black church has sometimes helped them do it. I know that's a tough pill to swallow. I know that might be rough for some of us to hear. But some of the things we have taught ourselves theologically have been reinforcement of our oppression and subjugation and not for our own advancement and our empowerment. And now that the pot is boiling over in 2021, now that we saw the pot boil over in the Capitol on Wednesday, January 6th, now that we see the pot boil and spill over and what public enemy has says is a fear of a black planet has manifested itself on the Capitol steps and people are spilling blood in the name of what they believe is white preservation and white dominance and white security. It has emerged and they can no longer keep the lid on it. We need to understand that this dominance does nothing but create division. God's intention that we would be suitable helpers. God's intention is that we would be connected as partners, not as those looking for position. Because we can't be dominant if you need a helper. And the sad reality is, is we've been going around helping white folks to be dominant over us for centuries. We've gone around and given them the freedom and the permission to exercise dominance over us because we have perpetuated some bad theology because we are not familiar with the story to know that we were written in it from the very beginning. But that's why you have to know the whole story. The whole story is that you weren't created to be subservient. You weren't created to be second class. You weren't created to be satisfied with the oppressor's benevolence. You weren't created to be three-fifths of a human being. You weren't created to be an afterthought. God created you in God's image to be an example of what good partnership looks like. God created you to be an asset to the conversation. God created you to grow with humanity and not against one another. God created you to partner with nature and all of its creation, not destroy and tear down down what you've been trying to produce. This faith isn't something that you came into late. Uh, this faith is a part of your DNA. This faith isn't something that somebody else had that they just wanted to share with you. This faith has been in your history since the beginning of time. Uh, this faith doesn't mean that you're better. It means you're just as good as everybody else. Doesn't mean that you're more important. It means that you're just as important. Doesn't mean, um, doesn't mean that uh, other folk don't matter. It means that you matter just as much as any other creation that God has made. And the shout is, it doesn't matter what they try to do to you. It doesn't matter how they try to erase you. Doesn't matter how they try to get rid of you. Doesn't matter how they try to do it. They can't write you out of the story. They can't erase you. They can't omit you. They can't paint you out of their pictures or write you out of their books because all you have to do is look at the story and you can see God had you in mind from the very beginning. Many of you who know, I close it like this, many of you who know a little bit about me uh, know that I have what I like to call a particular palate. Uh, my wife and many other folks say I'm a picky eater, but I like to call it a particular palette of great discretion. Thank you very much. And I don't like to say, I don't like a great many things. I admit to that. I don't like a great many things. And I don't like my flavors to mix up. I must admit it. I don't like a lot of sauces, don't like a lot of spices, different condiments and add-ons. They don't excite me. I am not one for trying a great many new things. I like what I like. I am that guy who doesn't like mustard on his hot dog, ketchup on his burger, 
I'm that guy who doesn't like pickles or relish or onions, no matter what kind of onion, red onion, white onion, little onion, Vidalia onion, big onion, don't matter. Tomatoes of any kind, any of that stuff, beefsteak tomatoes, small tomatoes, pearl tomatoes, cherry tomatoes, don't matter. We don't matter what you call it, I don't like it. I have a simple palate. It's my mouth. I like it the way it is. It's my palate. So in college, uh, one of my friends at the time was cooking, and I was reading what she was making, and I said, hold on. I said, I'm looking at this. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. It says it's got mayonnaise in it. I said, you know, I, I, I don't know if you know. I, I don't eat mayonnaise. I ain't going to eat no mayonnaise. I ain't going to eat it. They were like, really? They was like, for real? I was like, I ain't make that. Good luck with that. I hope you eat. I hope you're hungry because you're going to eat all that by yourself. I'm not, you know, that's not how I do. They said, um, and they said, for real? I said, I'm not going to eat it. I said, if you break it, I'm just telling you. I don't, I don't do mayonnaise like that, whatever. They was like, okay, fine. I'm going to put it in. I'm going to put it in. I'm going to put it in. Um, and so they grumbled about it, and they put, didn't put it in. So dinner time came, and it was time to eat, and we sat there, and we ate. And as we're eating, we're talking. She starts smiling, and she's saying, did you like it? How would you think? And I said, oh, no, this is good. I said, this is fantastic. I said, this is crazy. I said, this is a real good dish. She said, it's real good. She said, this is delicious. She said, I'm glad you like it. Would you want some more? I said, absolutely. I sure do. I sat there, gobbled it down, had my little second helping. I was satisfied. I was well fed with this here dinner. And I'm helping with the dishes later on. And she said, well, we was talking about it. And I said, uh, I said, that dish was good. And she smiled. And she said, I'm glad you liked it. She said, she looked, and I looked, and I took a look, and I looked over on the counter as I was putting stuff away, and I saw the mayonnaise jar. And the mayonnaise jar was full when I saw it the last time. But this time, I had a little bit taken out of it. I said, you didn't. She said, yes, I did. I sure did. I used that mayonnaise. I put that mayonnaise in there. And I said, what are you talking about? And I was mad. I'm trying to create an argument. I'm trying to get fussed. I can't believe you did that. I can't believe I said I ain't like mayonnaise. I can't believe you told me you weren't going to do it. You know, you being here dishonest. I'm running on, blah, blah. You can't believe you did this. I can't believe you acting up, blah, 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 blah. And she stopped me. She said, wait a second. Wait a minute. She said, you said you enjoyed the dish. She said you enjoyed the dinner. You didn't even know as you were eating it that it was in it. She said, I had to use it. I had to use it because if I didn't, it would have taken something away from the dish. If I had not used it, it would have taken something away, and it would not have tasted the same. Watch me. She said, it wouldn't have tasted the same if I took that ingredient out of it. I had to use it because it was going to add something to the meal. And because it was mixed in with everything else, you didn't even know it was there. But it's what you did know that was there that gave it the right flavor for you to enjoy it and for you to ask even for another helping. Some of y'all missing it. You've been living in a world thinking that you weren't a part of the mix. You've been living in a world where you didn't think you were involved or had a say-so. You didn't think that you had a major part in this thing called Christianity. You thought this Christian faith was something you just got because you were brought here from um, um, to America in change. But the reality is you're all up in the mix. The reality is from the very beginning, you've been in the recipe. From the beginning, the truth is you've been included um, because if you had been taken out the flavor wouldn't have been as good if you had been taken out it wouldn't taste the same it wouldn't go down the same it wouldn't be the same um, that if you had been taken out of the story the grace wouldn't be so sweet if you had been taken out of the story the mercy wouldn't be so good if your story had been taken out the redemption wouldn't stick to your ribs the way that it does if your story had been taken out. Resurrection wouldn't feed your soul the way it does. If the story had been taken out, Jesus wouldn't give you life the way Jesus
Jesus does. And all I'm saying is that in this moment, the Lord is sweet, I know. And because you understand that you're a part of the story and God is in the story and you're in the story from the very beginning, let that story give you strength. Let that story give you power. Let that story remind you of who you are. Let that story remind you that you are fearfully and wonderfully made because God has had you in mind from the very beginning. God wanted you to partner from the very beginning. God needs your help in protecting from the very beginning. And if you believe that God is still in the blessing business, God can turn this situation around. So keep on growing. Keep on reading the story. Keep on seeing your relevance in the power of what God has already done. You, Bennett, your strength is in the story. Your strength been in the story. Your, you've been written in for a long time now. And it's time for you to understand that no matter what they try to exclude, <laughs> they can't take you out of the story because God has written you in from the very beginning. And so as this moment, as we come into this place of invitation, there may be somebody right now, somebody we look to share in a moment who wants to be a part of the New Calvary Baptist Church family. Be a part of the family of believers. This invitation to Christian discipleship, my brothers and sisters, is for you. There may be somebody under the sound of my voice who wants to be a part of the New Calvary family. We would be honored and delighted. We love to be a church family. I love to be a pastor. We love to grow in understanding and God with you. But if you are also looking to just give your life to the Lord, looking to walk differently, looking to understand and to see God differently in your life, I want you to just extend your hand and say, God, I need you. God, I'm looking to understand things a little bit differently. God, I've tried this thing of life my way by myself, and I realize that I can't do it without you. Realize, dear God, that I need uh, something else. I need some help that I understand that I am the Betselem Elohim. I am created in your image. But as I am created in your image, God, I want to follow, not only look like you, but I want to live like you. Live like you would have me to live. Live like you would have me to see. Function like you would have me to function. Love like you would have me to love. And so God, I, I ask you to, to enter my heart right now. I'm opening my heart to you that you would continue to speak to me, that you would continue to lead me, that you would continue to guide me, that wherever I am, you might order my steps, that I might find a group of believers that continue to stretch me and grow me, and that I might learn to be everything that you would have me to be. We receive it all, and we thank you for it all. In the wonderful name of Jesus and the people of God, say amen. We celebrate and thank God with you in this moment for you in your life, in your new life, in your journey with God. And so we continue to partner as we share together in the journey of ministry. We're going to prepare our hearts and minds, my sisters and brothers. We're going to share at the communion table. And so we're going to give you that moment, give you that time to prepare your hearts and minds at the, at the table of communion that we would come together and receive these elements together. We recognize that as we give you all time to prepare whatever elements you have to share uh, in this moment, whatever represents uh, the bread and the body, or the, the blood and the body, we want to give you that time to do so. But we want to just remind you that at this table, when Jesus is with his disciples and he's sharing, and he's telling them what will happen, and he tells them, do not worry, don't fret, don't get upset about it because this is all a part of the process and they're wondering what's going to happen and what's going to remain but God says the reality is is that you're all part of the story that the story is already written you're in the story and you need to know that you need to use that faith to continue to keep you for the rest of the way And so we want you to remember at this table remember at this table that God Almighty has continued to keep each and every one of us through this story. 
that God's power, God's anointing, God has already paid the price, made the sacrifice that we could be at this table to remember the sacrifice that has been made for us. So as we share in this moment, and as you have your elements, we would say that the Lord God, for the day he was to be betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, as he gave it to his disciples, take and eat of this, for this is my body, which is broken for you. And in the same manner, he took the cup after the supper and he shared it with them, saying, this is my blood which will be shed for you. The Apostle Paul tells us that as often as we eat this bread and, and as we drink this cup, we do share the Lord's death until he comes. And so we are reminded of the sacrifice that was made and the goodness uh, of Jesus Christ's action to understand that he was taking care and that he was protecting creation so that we might have the key to eternal life. So, if all those who desire to be served are prepared to receive uh, and have in their possession the representation and the symbolism of our Lord's broken body, then let us share and eat together. shed blood for the remission of our sins and as a symbol and representation of the key to eternal life and sacrifice and let us drink together the people of God together say amen take this moment as we prepare to depart that I would just share this benediction with you would just receive this benediction. It is a benediction that I've put together, inspired by African prayers and blessings. So if you would just receive it and to hear that may God set you free. May God guard you night and day. May God set you in the right place. May God give you good health in mind, body, and spirit. May you be reminded, whether in the darkness or in the light, that God's grace is with you. May God's power elevate you to grow into greater things. May God's togetherness guide us and help us to bring peace and understanding to protect the world. And we believe this together, that it is so. And together, the people of God say, amen. God bless you. Go in peace. This ends our order of worship. Go and serve the Lord. We look forward to sharing with you tomorrow morning, Monday, 8 a.m. as we share in our morning prayer. So please be with us. Sign on. And we love to fellowship with you. Until next time, uh, take care of yourselves and each other. Bible study will be Wednesday at 7 p.m. We'll see you then. Take care. Peace.